Good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with the session on oral chronic graft versus host disease and some other people trickle in. Uh, that will be great. So my name is Kari Bailey, and I work for the National Merit Donor Program in our Office of Patient Advocacy. And I'm really excited to hear this presentation today from Dr. Treister on oral chronic GVHD. So just a few housekeeping notes. This session is designed to be interactive. And, you know, they're taping all of these sessions to make them available to those who are not able to attend. So we will hold all questions until the end. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle. So if you do have a question, I'm happy to either pass around the microphone or uh, if you want to step up to the microphone, that way it can all be recorded. So it's my pleasure right now to introduce Dr. Treister. Uh, Nathaniel Treister is Assistant Professor of Oral Medicine in the Department of Oral Medicine, Infection, and Immunity at Harvard School of Dental Medicine. He practices at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston with a special interest in or oral mucosal diseases, salivary gland diseases, and oral complications in cancer patients. Dr. Treister earned his DMD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine in 2000. He subsequently completed his oral medicine fellowship and oral biology training at Harvard School of Dental Medicine in 2005. He has published extensively in the field of oral medicine and is the co-author of a clinical handbook entitled Clinical Oral Medicine and Pathology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Treister. Thank you very much. I'm glad to see a few of you here. You know, the skin must have been a little bit more exciting or I've got some, some competing uh, sessions next door. So we're going to click the lights down a little bit. Hopefully this doesn't put anyone to sleep. But I actually partly came just to scope out how the lighting was during the skin talk, and I could see that when they were pointing out some of the cancers, you couldn't really see what they were showing very well. So um, having the lights down will be helpful. There are also the handouts in the back. I can see everyone got them. I just, just a little bit of background. Um, these, are, these are patient information sheets that we, the, the faculty in our um, oral medicine department at the hospital, um, actually put together from scratch. So um, I feel pretty strongly about the information that's in there, and we've actually updated these a couple times. If anyone got the Spanish version, it's not verbatim uh, because we've actually updated the English version, and we're in the process of updating the Spanish translation. Um, and those are also available um, directly by PDF download from the hospital website. Uh, the easiest way would, if you just Google Brigham Women's Oral Medicine, you'll, you'll be able to navigate to the site. So, for instance, I know some of you are going to bring this information back to your doctors. You know, they, rather than just making copies of this, could actually um, download, it, download this for other patients. So, again, my background, I'm trained as a dentist and then went into this field called oral medicine, which most of you haven't heard of. Um, but in my day-to-day -day practice, I, I really don't practice dentistry, although in our clinic I have residents that practice dentistry, and we actually do quite a bit of dental work and dental treatment planning for patients both before and very much after um, transplantation. So uh, that's sort of my background. It's, I sort of bridge the world between dentistry and medicine. So um, I know some of you are patients, some of you are you know, family members, maybe some of you are, are here just to learn a little bit more about, about GVHD in the mouth. I'm going to do a, a quick you know, 20, 25 minute overview and then we'll have um, time for questions. So. Usually when we're talking about GVHD in the mouth, this is what we think of. So we, we call these sort of lichenoid, um, you know, red, white, ulcerative lesions that can be really anywhere in the mouth, but in particular in the cheeks and the sides of the tongue. Um, and it makes the mouth really uncomfortable. So you try and, you know, eat or drink something that otherwise you would have never had a problem with. And, you know, it feels like you're, you know, putting an atomic bomb in your mouth. And the person sitting next to you says, no, it doesn't, it's, not, it's, not, it's not spicy at all. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, and what you're looking at here, this is a large area of ulceration. So this is actually a, a fairly severe case. Um, but there's a large continuum. So patients can have, and I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute. So I know that we're told not to include, you know, data and tables and graphs in these presentations for patients and their families, but I think this is a really telling uh, figure. This was published a few years ago from the group from the University of Washington. And basically this is just showing the various parts of the body that are affected by a large cohort of patients affected by graft-versus-host disease. And what you can see is, is that both skin and mouth are the two most common, most frequently affected sites. Um, affecting to some degree upwards of 80 to 90% of all patients that develop GVHD, 
which depending on if you got your, you know, your cells from a sibling versus an unrelated donor, um, that risk ranges anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. So just a little bit of overview about graft versus host disease in the mouth. So it actually may be the initial site of presentation. Um, it's not uncommon. We don't really know how predictive that is for what's going to happen next in the mouth or anywhere else in the body. And we're actually in the middle of doing a study to look at that um, using, using our patient database at the, at the hospital. Um, really wide range of symptoms. So someone may come in and just say, my mouth feels kind of rough inside. Or, you know, when I go to eat, it's feeling kind of tight, especially towards the corners of the mouth. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on. Or someone may, you know, have the um, symptoms of sensitivity, like I had reported or noticed that they're getting blisters in the mouth. Um, as far as what it looks like, I showed you already the most classic finding are these lacy white reticulations. It almost looks like a spiderweb pattern, um, like you could see here. And I'll show you some more examples of that. Also, the erythema component, so that's redness. Erythema is just a medical term we use to describe redness. And then ulcers, where the tissue is actually broken down. So it's actually very interesting because the GVHD in one small little area, for instance, here, you have both thickening of the tissue, or what we call hyperkeratosis. The redness is thinning of the tissue, and then ulceration. And it's all happening right next to each other. So the inflammation causes a variety of different types of responses in the tissue. Also, very importantly, and what's often under-recognized, is GVHD affecting the salivary glands. Um, and I have a whole slide to talk about that. But uh, that's sort of the silent, I would say, sort of side of GVHD in the mouth, because we don't really see it. Someone can have a completely normal-looking mouth but say, you know, my mouth is feeling kind of dry or I feel like I'm really having to sip water a lot of the time or I'm starting to have trouble swallowing, food's kind of getting stuck in the mouth. Um, and very importantly, and again, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, is this really, really, really increases the risk of dental cavities in the mouth. And unfortunately, with the last bullet, and I know that the skin section, the, the skin session ended on this also, is we see a, a significantly increased risk of developing mouth cancer. And again, I'll talk about that towards the end. So here's just a, a panel of a few <coughs> different um, presentations. So the lips are actually frequently affected. This is sort of an area that um, oftentimes can be addressed by both dermatologists as well as oral medicine. And here you can see the lips with um, you know, a fairly mild um, white, sort of these white um, reticular changes. Whereas in this patient, we see the white changes, but we also see redness as well as ulcerations. Lips can feel tight, burning, very sensitive, um, easily split open and start bleeding. And then the tongue also very frequently affected. And again, just to show you the range where we see this patient who really just only has these white reticular um, lacy changes. Another patient who's got the white changes, but also with very extensive ulcerations. Um, the cheek also or what we call the buccal mucosa in medical terms, one of the most frequently affected sites, usually the first place where this develops. Um, and again, you can see, you know, sort of a wide range of how this can look. So here you have this sort of very classic um, lacy changes, a little bit of redness and ulceration. Down here, the same changes, but with more extensive ulceration. Um, this was the one I showed you before with a very large area of ulceration. And then sometimes we even see these, we, they're almost like plaque-like changes. So it doesn't really have that lacy appearance, but it almost looks like just a white film. Um, and interestingly, sometimes once the GVHD has really sort of gone away and it's not really inflamed anymore, um, we'll see these sort of persistent white changes. And oftentimes we'll have this, this type of appearance on the cheeks and on the tongue, side of the tongue. These are areas that we tend to just keep an eye on um, because we think they may be at some risk for eventually turning into something else, but they can persist for you know years afterwards. So I sort of broke things down to mucosa versus the salivary glands. So what are the actual features of each? And I've kind of gone through this a little bit. So the mucosa, we've already talked about the, the what it looks like and what it feels like typically is the sensitivity. And that's a, a term that we like to use rather than pain because we have many patients, and some of you may experience this, where if I asked on a regular daily basis in the last week, just sitting at rest, talking, you know, thinking, but not eating or drinking or brushing your teeth or doing anything like that, 
what's the most pain you've had in, that you would score in your mouth? And we have a nice, you know, 0 to 10 scale in the clinic. And patients will usually report 0, maybe 1, maybe 2 at the most, even if the mouth looks really bad. And then we ask about sensitivity, and that's when the number jumps up to 8, 9, or 10 out of 10. Um, tooth brushing can be very, very uncomfortable, and that's typically not necessarily because the, the gums themselves are affected by the GVHD, although it, they can be. And it's not because of the, the, the actual mechanical brushing, but usually because of the toothpaste. And the tooth, toothpaste, especially for adults, has a number of preservatives um, and cleansing sort of detergents in them that, that make it very, like, sort of a spicy sensation. Um, and so I'll get to this in a minute, but doing something as simple as using a children's toothpaste will make tooth brushing very comfortable. Um, also, development of blisters on the roof or what we call superficial mucosils. Um, this, is, this is a component of the salivary gland component of GVHD. So in addition to large, what we call major salivary glands, we also have little ones that are literally all throughout the mouth, but in particular, they're in very high concentration in the palate. And so it's not uncommon for those to become sort of leaky. And you get these little fluid-filled blisters. Um, oftentimes, they're thought to be some sort of infection. Um, and they're not. It's just, a, it's just a response from the GVHD. And they can actually come and go sometimes within hours. So someone goes to eat. They pop up. They're sort of uncomfortable. They sting a little bit. And then two hours later, they're, you know, there were 15, and now there's one or two. And they can literally come and go like that. With the salivary gland disease, Primary symptom is dry mouth, or what we call xerostomia. You know, my mouth feels dry. Difficulty eating because of that, difficulty speaking, difficulty swallowing, all because of either lack of saliva or because the saliva has been in some way altered. So it's not the normal composition. Um, this significantly increases the risk of dental cavities, and especially a specific pattern, which I'll show you, um, and also recurrent yeast infections in the mouth, or what's called candidiasis. So this is an example of the blisters. Um, and you can see in this case that there's really no significant what we consider mucosal GVHD in the area. So we don't see all the white lacy changes. There's no ulcers. We just see these little minor salivary glands that have sort of become, become these little blisters. And these will come and go. Um, for, this, for this specific component of GVHD, if anyone was going to ask me, there's really not a lot that can be done. Sometimes the topical therapies can help. Um, and sometimes when they're really annoying, patients can literally just go in and pop them either with their finger. Sometimes I've had patients that use a, um, you know, a, a, a sterilized needle, which is perfectly fine. Um, it's an easy solution. So how do we manage mucosal disease? We'll talk about this first, and then we'll talk about the salivary gland disease. So the high-potency topical steroids work very well inside the mouth. Um, the first thing I'll say, just because if some of you were at the skin session, the nice thing about the mucosa, the inside of the mouth, which does not pertain to the lips, so anything we talk about the lips, we're really talking about skin, but inside the mouth, we have no side effects from use of the very high potency topical steroids. So it doesn't cause, the, it doesn't cause um, thinning of the mucosa, it doesn't cause blistering or bleeding or tightness or anything. So it's, it's actually very nice because it means that when we need to, we can treat the mouth very aggressively. Um, the two steroids that we tend to use are clobetazole and fluosininide, and these are at the sort of the highest two levels of potency for topical steroids. Someone in the skin session earlier was asking about a triamcinolone cream, which is sort of like a, a mild to moderate um, potency. In the mouth, we never use triamcinolone. It's just not worth it. It's much easier and much more effective for a patient to use sort of some of the hardest hitting medication and maybe only use it once a day or twice a day versus having to try to apply something, you know, five, six, seven times a day. <clears throat> the gels are ideal for the mouth when we're treating a very localized area because gels are what we call hydrophilic. They are absorbed well into a wet contact surface whereas what's usually used for the skin is ointments or maybe creams. Ointments don't work in the mouth at all because it's like a Vaseline base and it's like oil and water. It just doesn't work. Um, otherwise, and much more frequently, we use solutions because it's much easier to treat the mouth just putting a solution in that you can swish around versus saying, okay, I have a sore here, I've got something else here. 
this side of my cheek hurts, the back of my tongue hurts, I've got this tube of gel, my mouth is full of saliva, and somehow I'm going to just put it everywhere, and it's going to stay there, and then I'm going to try it again later in the day. You know, it's, it's a disaster for most patients. So even if it's just one side of the tongue that's a problem, I'll typically still prescribe the dexamethasone solution because it doesn't, for in most patients, it's very, very, very rare for there to be any systemic uptake. So maybe a little bit can get into the blood vessels through the, through the mucosa, but it's not like taking, pill, taking additional prednisone. Dexamethasone, topically, it's like your prednisone prescription or prednisolone or whatever you're being treated with orally. Um, so, and the contact time is very important. So when we use the dexamethasone, it's five minutes of swishing and then spitting out. And it's not uncommon that I'll have a patient referred to me from the oncologist and they say, yep, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble with my oral GVHD. My, my physician prescribed dexamethasone. I've been using it for two months and it just doesn't seem to be helping. And my first question is, so what are you doing? They said, well, you know, I'm using it as they prescribed. I said, no, no, but tell me specifically, how are you using it? So I put it in my mouth, I swish around for maybe 30 seconds, I spit out. I say, okay, and how many times a day, twice a day? I said, okay, so the first thing we're gonna do before we even think about changing, you know, plans at all, is you're gonna go from 30 seconds to five minutes, and usually their eyes kind of open up. And then you're gonna do it three or four times a day rather than twice a day, I'll see you in a month. And in most cases, things improve tremendously and we don't need to change anything. Um, another treatment that I use is clobetazole, which is only commercially available as a gel but can be compounded. So if you have a compounding pharmacy or if any of you have any trouble, there's a pharmacy that I use pretty much exclusively in the Boston area, um, but they actually ship throughout the country and they don't charge for the shipping, so they're a fantastic pharmacy. Um, clobetazole compounded as a solution works very well for more sort of recalcitrant uh, GVHD in the mouth. And then topical tacrolimus, um, which is what's called a calcineurin inhibitor. So some of you may be familiar, more familiar with the medication cyclosporin. Um, it's very closely related. Um, and interestingly, the use of cyclosporin topically in the mouth has never really shown to be nearly as effective as tacrolimus for reasons we don't really understand very well. So tacrolimus is available commercially as an ointment um, that works very well for the lips, very well for the lips, because um, the use of the topical steroids on the lips and the face will cause irreversible thinning changes and make the skin very fragile. Protopic does not have that effect. Um, so protopic for the lips and then inside the mouth, I have it compounded as a solution just like the clobetazole. And very often I use what I call combination therapy. So if somebody's been on dexamethasone, I see them again after a month, maybe they've had some mild improvement, but really they're not doing very well. The next thing I'll typically do is prescribe tacrolimus as well and actually have them use both at the same time. And I'll show you some examples of that. So here are just some examples of patients being treated. So this is sort of your, your you know, before and after, um, although I'm not trying to sell anything here. So here you have um, this patient who presented with ulceration, redness, and really thick, extensive white hyperkeratotic changes. Mouth was very uncomfortable, very tight, and this is after one month of treatment, and you can see that the whiteness has really dissipated considerably. The ulceration has completely cleared up, and there's very minimal redness. Um, same thing in this slide where we have almost complete resolution um, just from topical therapy. These are patients where we didn't make any changes otherwise in their underlying immunosuppressive regimen. These are examples of the topical therapies that I use most frequently. So this is the dexamethasone, which is available commercially. And interestingly, this is really why, not just for GVHD, but for other oral medicine conditions that we treat, dexamethasone is basically our treatment of choice because it's a very potent, well-tolerated, effective topical steroid, except that it's not actually uh, indicated for topical use. So this is really for patients who otherwise wouldn't be able to tolerate swallowing dexamethasone tablets or capsules. Um, so this is really meant to be swallowed, uh, but obviously we use it topically and have the patient spit out. This is an example of a compounded tacrolimus prescription. And, um, and again, what I have patients do once they get the two prescriptions is get some sort of smaller bottle and prepare a few days worth at a time, shake up each bottle, pour equal parts, shake that up each time. You don't even have to measure it. The exact amount is really not critical. 
we'll probably have far more medication and suspension than it's actually doing anything. So you just swig a small amount, swish it for five minutes, and spit out, and you don't need to do two consecutive uh, therapies. The main complication from topical therapy is secondary yeast infection in the mouth, and it's just because you're further sort of suppressing the immune surveillance in the oral cavity, and one of its roles is to not have an infection develop. So for any of you that have had thrush or you know, have developed it in the past, you always have it in your mouth. It's just that typically it's kept in check, and there's a number of aspects of the GVHD with respect to changes with the saliva, topical immunosuppressive therapy, underlying system systemic immunosuppressive therapy that will increase the risk. And it typically appears with these white sort of almost cottage cheese-like plaques that will sort of, you know, appear indiscriminately throughout the oral cavity, um, can actually make the mouth quite uncomfortable. Uh, <clears throat> and it's very easy to manage with an antifungal therapy. So um, fluconazole is a, an oral, you know, systemic antifungal agent, works very, very well, um, can have, when used uh, on a daily basis over an extended period of time, can have a significant impact on some of the other immunosuppressive medications that are being taken orally, so that needs to be considered. Um, but what we typically do is we'll treat for maybe a week up front, and then for somebody who's staying on long-term topical therapy, we'll go to just a once-a-week dose, and that's typically enough. So you take one fluconazole pill on Saturday or Sunday, and the infection won't come back. There are topical treatments also, but they're much more, you know, therapy-intensive. So in most cases, we stick with the systemic therapy. Also, um, reactivation of herpes simplex um, virus is fairly common in patients with GVHD. Um, this is really due more to the underlying immunosuppression than having anything to do with topical therapy or specifically probably GVHD in the mouth. But it's not uncommon that we see patients with GVHD in the mouth that also will develop um, recurrent uh, herpes in the mouth. And so main consideration is overall level of immunosuppression. But keep in mind that what a breakthrough infection can happen. So you may be on acyclovir or Valtrex for standard prophylaxis and still develop an infection despite being on the medication. So typically we treat with those medications and we just increase the dose. And these are a couple of examples. So I showed you ulcers previously, and this is more typical of what the herpes ulcers will look like. So they're more discreet, they can be very painful, uh, much, much, much more painful than you would think for the size. Um, and although they can develop anywhere in the mouth, when it's inside the mouth and not your typical cold sore outside the, on the lips, um, it will typically be on the palate or the tongue or the gums, but really can develop anywhere. Okay, salivary gland GVHD. So I talked about the fact that the mouth can feel dry. This can be because of there being less saliva, also because of just altered saliva. So I actually have a lot of patients that will look like they have excellent salivary flow. You look, the floor of the mouth is full of, you know, very nice liquidy looking spit. Um, and they actually admit that. So if I ask them, how much does it seem like you don't have enough spit? They'll say, no, no, it seems like the normal amount. It's just that if I talk for, you know, 10 seconds, my mouth is completely dry. So symptoms, including dryness, are also pain, discomfort, burning, sensitivity, very similar to the same types of symptoms we see sometimes be just because of the mucosal changes. And again, the dental cavities and recurrent yeast infections are really the most important considerations. And this is the type, the type of typical pattern that we see. So they'll develop along the gum line, or what we call the cervical margin of the teeth, and also in between the teeth, um, sometimes even along the biting surface of the teeth. And this is a very sort of unique, specific pattern that we really only see typically in patients who have some sort of significant underlying salivary problem. And just to show sort of how severe this can be, um, we do evaluations for all of our patients before undergoing transplant. So this is a full mouth series of radiographs on this patient prior to um, within probably three months of their hospital admission for transplant. 
Um, and I know most of you are probably not dentists out there, but what I'll tell you is that there is one little filling here, one little filling here, little filling up here. Otherwise, the patient had no cavities, no treatment that needed to be done prior. Um, this is just over a year, less than a year and a half after transplant. Unfortunately, this was the first time the patient was referred to me for evaluation. And you can see not just the fact that there's dental caries present, but some of these teeth, it's already been so extensive that just from chewing, the teeth have already broken off. And the x-rays, again, you're not dentists. I'm not going to try and teach you about this. But if you look at these, these look normal. And you look at these, and it looks like there's big pieces that are just basically getting taken out of the teeth. Um, and this is the classic pattern of what we call interproximal decay. And it's why taking these types of x-rays is very important. Um, I just had a patient on Thursday I was seeing for the first time um, that had been sort of been managed by their transplant oncologist for the first month and a half or so of oral symptoms, then was referred to me because it really wasn't helping very much. Um, and as part of my examination, I noted one or two areas that looked like a little bit of this was starting. And so I got x-rays and noted about five or six teeth um, with considerable decay already developing, a lot of it happening right at the margins of previously placed crowns. So um, this is just another example of what we can see before there's actually even decay. We can see these sort of what we call decalcification areas where it'll have this sort of almost a whiter, whiter appearing look um, than the rest of the teeth. And this is only within about um, four or five months later where um, you can see that those areas that were initially just looked like decalcifications are actually starting to break down with the actual obvious um, yellowish, uh, orangish dental caries. So how do we manage? Prevention is really, really, really important. So brushing regularly, brushing after every meal, flossing, um, diet, so you can talk to your dentist about this, but avoiding sugary, sweet things, not drinking sugary drinks throughout the day. So if you tell me that, you know, you need sugar in your coffee once or twice a day or a Coke once a day, um, just like people have talked about earlier in the, you know, throughout this, this, this symposium, you know, you've got to live your life, but you know, the way to manage the dryness in your mouth is not to sip sweetened iced tea all throughout the day because it's basically going to gonna really encourage these cavities to form. Uh, topical fluoride, um, ideally used in trays. So these are the types of trays that your dentist can make. Um, and it's a prescription fluoride gel that sits on the teeth for, for at least 20 or 30 minutes a day. Um, some people just leave them in overnight. Uh, there's also something called fluoride varnish that your dentist can apply. Um, and that should be applied at least twice a year, probably upwards of four times a year. We don't have really good guidelines. It's something that's just painted on the teeth. And there's also something that's fairly new in the field of dentistry called remineralizing agents. Um, there's not great data out there yet, but uh, within the last six months or so, I've incorporated this into our sort of management regimen. Um, and so this is a paste that's applied to the teeth and then the fluoride's put on over it. And those two components together um, are probably much better than the fluoride alone. Uh, routine dental visits are very important, um, and everyone should see their dentist within one year. So if you get to the one-year point and, you know, your doctor's been telling you, I really don't want you going back to your dentist yet, at that point, that's the time where you should go. Um, and even if you're not aware of any problems, those x-rays should be taken. If there's any cavities noted, they should be treated immediately. They shouldn't just be watched because they can advance pretty quickly. So whereas in another patient, they may say, you know what, this is pretty small. We'll keep an eye on it. Let's wait until there's something else to do. Um, you shouldn't wait for these. Over-the-counter saliva substitutes, some people find um, helpful. Um, chewing gum, uh, sugar-free gum, sugar-free candy can help just stimulate saliva. And then there's actually prescriptions. Um, they're called sialagogues, um, pilocarpine. Um, some of you may have heard of, um, it can be used to actually stimulate the salivary glands to produce more saliva. I have a, a slide at the end that you all have in your handout that's sort of the most common prescriptions, so don't worry about writing down funny names. Um, and those can work very well for some patients. Uh, also, again, we talked about diet. So last thing, and I know I'm going to run out of time in a second, is just to talk about the risk of second cancers. Um, you know, we never want to talk about this, but it's really important. And you see on the information sheet, the last paragraph on the second side um, talks about this as well. So patients who have undergone stem cell transplant, allogeneic stem cell transplant, are at risk for a number of different types of second cancers. 
What we're talking about are solid cancers. So in the very immediate post-transplant period, there's something called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease, or PTLD. We're not going to talk about that right now. It's not relevant for the mouth. Um, there's risk of secondary or obviously relapse of uh, hematologic cancer. And then there's the risk of solid cancers. And you can see what's important about the solid cancers is, is early on, we're really not concerned about them. It's over time, so the longer you do well, the higher your risk becomes. And unfortunately, GVHD in the mouth appears to be a significant risk factor specifically for cancer in the mouth. Um, as far as severity of GVHD, difficulty managing ulcers versus not ulcers, we really don't know. Um, and these are some examples of what these cancers can look like. So you can see, typically looks considerably different from the GVHD. So even if you've had really active GVHD in the mouth, you've had sores coming and going, you've had these white changes, red areas, you know, GVHD doesn't cause a, an area to grow outwards or to develop these sort of funny sort of, you know, um, papillary types of projections. Same thing here. It's not going to have this thicker, white, red, sort of pebbly appearance to it. Um, but it can be difficult. So for instance, this patient here, this developed in an area of active GVHD on that cheek, and the patient had GVHD active throughout the mouth. Um, and this developed very quickly. So we were treating the GVHD, and then all of a sudden, about six weeks later, um, just before the patient was supposed to come back in, called me and said, you know, in the last two or three days, I have really intense pain that I didn't have before. I said, okay, you know, I come in, you know, in the next few days. And obviously, we biopsied it. Um, also, this, this is an actual pediatric patient. Um, this developed in an area, I'll wrap up in just a second, this, this developed in an area where um, there had previously been very extensive, fairly refractory ulcerative GVHD. We had treated, we had managed the symptoms well, eventually it resolved, and then this developed a couple of years later, but actually in that same area. So summary slide, right on time. Uh, oral GVHD, it's actually very common, going back to that first slide I showed you, about as common as, as the skin maybe the initial site, huge range of symptoms. So just because you have it, it doesn't mean that you're suffering, doesn't mean you, you know, can or can't do all these things, but it's going to vary based on each patient, just like in the same theme that they ended with yesterday. Every single one of my patients is unique in some way. You know, nobody's, there's no absolute cookie cutter approach. Um, management, the topical corticosteroids, topical um, tacrolimus, um, avoiding certain types of foods, um, even with good effective treatment, you're probably still going to have to modify your diet a bit. Most people figure that out pretty quickly. Um, management of the, of the dry mouth with the salivary stimulants, moisturizing agents, sialagogues, um, use of a, a mild or a child's toothpaste, um, seeing the dentist regularly. Um, and again, you know, each patient is going to be different. For many of you, you may just need to see your dentist, you know, once a year for a dental checkup, and you may never have a problem even with GVHD in the mouth. Um, oral cancer surveillance, so your dentist, you need to be aware. Your transplant physician should be looking and, and trying to identify anything because every time cancer develops, it's not going to be painful or it's not going to be painful at first. So there may be cases where, you know, it's just something just feels a little bit different, but otherwise you wouldn't really think of it. Um, and GVHD in the mouth may require treatment for many, many years. Um, we're collecting data on this right now. We don't, I can't give you a number right now. So the best number that's out there in the literature for overall systemic therapy is patients will be on a median of two to three years of treatment, meaning that half of patients are on treatment for less than two to three years, half more, and that's sort of in the middle. But that's for systemic therapy, and I have many patients who I continue to treat for years with quite active GVHD in the mouth being off of all their systemic immunosuppressive therapy. And you have this slide. I'm not going to go through all this, but um, hopefully this should be helpful, something you can maybe type back to your doctors um, or specialists that you see um, if they need any guidance. And I'm more than happy to, obviously I'm going to answer questions now, but um, if any of you have questions in the future, I can write down my email address. I'm happy to always happy to answer questions, right? or if you have questions you want to pass along to your physician, I'm happy to talk to them as well. So thank you very much.
How long how long ago was your transplant? Nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety? Excellent. And, um, I have a couple of patients like you in my in my I, practice. I, 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 had to, I had my mouth so bad I couldn't eat, and they ended up having to take all my teeth out. Mm-hmm. That was four years later after the transplant. Yeah. And so I have dentures, but the sores still come back. Yep. And to try to. So so again, you can have active GVHD yeah, twenty something and, years after. And, and I'm like. Sometimes I think it's, I hate the gum, the sugarless. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, boy, I can chew gum again. <laughs> but then I started getting sore. So mm-hmm. I said, now, what, what am I supposed to do? I use that. So I constantly walk around with water all the time. Yep. But I don't, the only thing that works probably for me is the, um, the pill called... Um, Salogen. No, it's not that. Evozac? It's Diflucan. Diflucan. Okay, so if that's helping, that means that you're... So is your mouth real dry? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a, again, you know, I'm, I'm limited in only 25 minutes of material, but for talk for more of a medical audience, I would go into more depth about the problems with yeast infections. If you wear, if you wear an oral prosthesis, which is a fancy name for denture, so if you wear a denture, it puts you at an astronomically higher risk level for developing recurrent infections. And that's because the prosthesis itself will actually harbor the the yeast, and so it you're like continuously infecting the tissue from that as well. So there's a few things to do. One, even with what I'm going to talk about, if necessary, using that once a week fluconazole prophylaxis can be very effective. Chances are, even if you didn't do anything else, what I'm about to tell you, you wouldn't have the problem. And it's a very safe medication. One di- once a week pill, it doesn't increase your risk of the CML coming back. It doesn't increase your risk of cancer. It's very safe. Um, but more importantly is the denture itself needs to be disinfected. And the easiest, cheapest, most effective way is a very dilute household bleach solution. So get your Clorox bleach, mix it about one parts bleach to ten parts water, you can just eyeball it. You don't need a you know, special measuring device. And soak it in that every night, and then just rinse it in water afterwards. It'll kill everything. Okay. It may be that just doing that is all you need to do, and you don't need the fluconazole. So I'd try that first. Okay. But don't rinse your mouth with bleach. No, no. Okay. No, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Mm-hmm. My name is Virginia, and I've been um, out for five years. And the last two years, two years ago, I started having dental problems. Mm-hmm. And um, about a month ago, my tooth just tipped away. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm going back to the dentist next week. But my teeth are real sensitive. Doesn't matter what I do. Um, I use a sensitive toothpaste. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. Still sensitive. I still have dry mouth, mm-hmm. and like you said, when you start talking, you, you have to stop. But um, I'm almost to the point where I'm, I'm ready to tell the dentist to just take them all out because it's just, it's just, um, there's so many cavities that just come up, um, like you said, um, they'll just come up today, and then next week I have Yeah. One. So I think in, in a situation like this, so we'll, we'll we actually see a number of patients in our clinic where the intent is not necessarily to provide the treatment there, but to to do a really sort of comprehensive evaluation and provide guidelines back to the treating dentist. Um, Where do you live? In Chicago. Okay. Um, That's where I'm from originally. So there are, there's a, unfortunately a couple of people have just left recently, but there's a pretty good group at the University of Illinois at Chicago, um, and so if you send me an email at some point, there's there's someone I'd be, I could refer you to for that type of evaluation, and it's important to, to sort of take a, a step back because it may be that you have, let's say, eight teeth with problems right now. I, I mean, I'm just going to throw this out there, and it may be that really two or three of them can be treated very easily and with some of these other measures we talked about, like the more intensive fluoride therapy, the remineralizing agents, that we can actually get that stable 
And it may be that the other ones are, there's so much damage already, and the overall prognosis, even if they can be fixed, is so poor that it may be better just to get rid of those. But to go from however many teeth you have right now to full dentures like this other patient is a big difference. And if you can maintain even a few teeth on the top and the bottom and have what's called a partial denture, your function will, not to say that her function is not good, but your function will be much, much superior if there's teeth for it to clasp onto. So it's not uncommon for patients to feel like you or it just gets frustrating. You're like, just, I don't want to keep getting nickeled and dimed. I don't want to keep worrying about this. Let's just get them out. And for some patients, that is the way to go. But, and, you know, and, and also keep in mind that implants for some people, you know, they're expensive, but it is an option. Um, and sometimes even when all the teeth have to be taken out, um, placing just select implants for an implant-supported prosthesis can be a very nice approach where, you know, because then the denture doesn't move around at all. But it's expensive, and unfortunately for most people, medical will not cover any of this, and it's something we're working on, but it's, it's a long, long, long challenge. Rural areas. Where do you live? What state? Georgia. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Fluoride varnish is very standard. So if it's not something they use regularly in their practice, they can get it. Okay. So it's, it's, it's something that um, in the pediatric dentistry world is, is big. So it's part of, you know, sort of identifying, you know, it's, it's something, one of these things that's used in, you know, sort of like school outreach programs. Um, you know, a way to sort of, it's like a, a very important sort of dental public health measure. Um, and how and in what ways it's used in adults and older patients, um, I think is sort of still evolving. So like I said, even with the guidelines of how many times to put it on, we don't really know, probably four times a year in somebody who's, you know, high risk. But they should be able to. Yep. Would you say that the everything you're talking about would be just as relevant in a child, like a two, three-year-old child, and who hasn't lost their baby teeth. And once the adult teeth come in, is it the same concerns or are there other concerns? So, so overall, the concerns are exactly the same. Um, with baby teeth, I mean, obviously, we don't want an infection. But in reality, um, you know, baby teeth are really not as important as adult teeth because you only have them for a few years. There are some teeth that are more important than other teeth because some of them act as placeholders, whereas others just act for function. So the dentist would know which are more important. So for instance, if one tooth needed to be pulled, um, there's something called a space maintainer that can be placed that holds the space until the premolars erupt when they're about 12 or so. Um, so that's, that's really the only specific, I'd say, baby teeth pediatric consideration. Otherwise, they're all the same considerations. Um, the one thing is, is that with, with, with children, the overall incidence of GVHD is considerably lower, probably having to do with the fact that the immune system is sort of more plastic is the term we use. Um, so it's better able to sort of deal with the transplant. Um, but with that being said, some will develop GVHD. It tends to be more mild than what we see in adults, but again, there's going to be some that develop basically the exact same type of severe GVHD. So whereas I have a, and also the number of children is much less than the number of adults undergoing transplant, and especially now with you know, reduced intensity where we have many, many more adults being treated. Um, you know, my practice, I have I can't even tell you how many adults I, I see or, you know, see on some basis with GVHD in the mouth. As far as children go, I typically have, like, you know, two or three at any given time that are sort of the, the ones that I'm really managing. So, but I think otherwise the considerations are exactly the same. It doesn't have insurance. Sure. Uh, it's a factor for everybody. And so, can any dentist do what you're talking about, or does he need to... Tell the dentist anything special with the bubbles, Any dentist can. And, you know, most dentists, you just say, my son has graft versus host disease. They're going to look at you like, yeah, what kind of car is that? Or, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, they're not going to know what you're talking about. 
you say bone marrow transplant, they'll kind of know a little bit. I mean, unfortunately, most dentists have fairly minimal medical training. Um, and what they do learn, it's so minimally incorporated into the overall dental curriculum that by the time they graduate and get their degree, they've forgotten most of what they learned in the first couple of years. Um, and it's, it's not, I'm not trying to say anything bad about dentists. It's, you're, you're training very intensively for four years to be able to become really good at doing something where in most cases you really don't need to be thinking about these other things. So, you know, there are some resources available. Um, you know, we have these information sheets, for instance. There, um, you know, there's publications in the literature describing, you know, sort of overall, you know, approaches, management. But there's nothing other than, other than understanding what's going on and sort of why it's putting the patient at risk and sort of thinking about some of those very specific considerations. So, for instance, the pattern of dental decay, um, the, the, the rate at which it can progress, um, a dent, you know, it, their teeth, they're still their teeth. So the, any dentist should be able to manage this, and especially with a little bit more information, um, you know, should be comfortable. And again, I'm always happy, you know, I mean, part of when I see a new patient, my letter goes to my, my consultation note goes to obviously the, the transplant physician, primary care doctor, and the dentist. So um, everything that's in my note, I'll go into a lot of detail, and in some of it's very medical, and some of it's very dental, and I think it's very important that everybody is getting that same note. So, uh, do you know any um, one in the uh, Orlando area? Um, Can you recommend anybody down So, the two oral medicine centers in Florida are there's there's a few very good people at Nova Southeastern in Fort Lauderdale. And there's a very good group at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Those are sort of your, your two centers. So I don't know which. Uh, Gainesville, I assume, is closer. So it may be worth, a, I mean, what is it, two or three hours or further? Not even that far. Okay. So it may be worth doing, you know, like a one visit there to get this sort of, you know, sort of comprehensive um, evaluation and have that person so that you have someone local in the state that can be the sort of um, person in, in touch with the local dentist. I think that's a great approach, and I could give you names of people there. Right, yep. All right, we have time maybe for two or three sure. more questions. Yeah. 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 I'm a dentist, and I just started going back to practice with mm. my daughter in Gainesville, Florida. There you go. You are spot on, Dr. Trace. Thank you. Spot <laughs> on. And most dentists can be brought up to speed because we live in the information age. Right. You know, and it's not rocket science. Exactly. You, know, you, you don't need to understand all the biology. I mean, it's just you need to know the important features and facts. That's right. Uh, now, my question is restoration of these uh, teeth that can take restoration. Yep. You prefer the fluoride-releasing glass ionomers? I do. For the, for the cervical lesions, glass ionomers, and for interproximal amalgam. And I really like the Fuji IX or Fuji 9. It's just, it's my, I mean, it's so easy to use, and it doesn't require light, and you can have a little bit of saliva, and it doesn't kill it. Um, you can adapt it really well. You know, because some of those lesions that you saw that look like they're just along the gum line, they'll wrap literally all the way around and extend below the gum a little bit. And no matter how good of a dentist you are, it's not easy to restore those teeth. So. You spoke a little bit about um, fluzonic, fluzonic fluconazole, and yes. And the impact it has with Celsep uh, and... Uh, Not so much Celsep, but especially tacrolimus and serolimus. Yeah, the cyclosporin. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so basically the, the fluconazole has an impact on enzymes in the liver that are important for how cyclosporin and tacrolimus are metabolized. And so if you take fluconazole regularly, it will actually lead to those levels going higher. And so in some cases, the dose needs to be adjusted. So, you know, you're, you're, if you're still on cyclosporin now, every however often, they'll check your levels and just make sure. So the actual dose you take is really not important. Like if you say, oh, I'm on, you know, 10 milligrams, I, we use tacrolimus, so I... I 
Cyclosporin, I think, is 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams. Okay, I, like I said, because I'm just not, not going. So you may say, oh, I take 25, and that person may say, oh, I'm taking 200. Your doctors may be trying to immunosuppress you at the same level, and it may just be that, you know, at that dose, your levels stay within range, and at that dose, his levels stay within range. So the issue shows up in your liver test. It's not the liver test. It's actually the, so the liver test will look completely normal. It doesn't actually affect the liver values. It will literally affect the cyclosporin level. So that's a test that they order every once in a while just to make sure that you're still within range. Like there's a, it's a, there's a therapeutic range. So if the number is really low, they're going to up your dose because it's like it's not even worth being on it if your levels are too low. If they're too high, then you're going to start, you know, being at higher risk for developing problems in your kidneys and other areas. So they'll want to dose reduce it. So sometimes if I put someone on a week of flu fluconazole, we really need to treat an infection, you know, get it under control. At that point, they may like hold the medication for a few days and then have them start again. You know, it's it's a, you know, it's it's an art just as much as a science. But then it gets recorded. Do you recommend um, prophylactic antibiotics for um, like dental caries? So the only reason that anybody after transplant should receive dental uh, antibiotic prophylaxis is according to published guidelines by the American Heart Association having to do with the heart. There are no guidelines or no reasons why anybody with GVHD should. The only sort of caveat to that is when somebody, and it's not usually post-transplant, it's usually pre-transplant when somebody has, you know, active leukemia, lymphoma, and or they're being treated, um, where what's called the absolute neutrophil count or the ANC is very low. In those cases, sometimes we will give antibiotics as a prophylaxis, but not as a single dose. So the idea of a single dose prophylaxis is typically because we think that bacteria could get into the blood and then, you know, seed onto a heart valve, for instance. You're not at any higher risk than that. You're not at any increased risk unless you've had a prosthetic heart valve placed. But in that case, the reason for, being the anti for, for receiving antibiotic prophylaxis is because of the heart having nothing to do with your transplant. But in those cases when the, when the immune system is really, really, really suppressed, um, like I said, an absolute neutrophil count of 500 or lower, um, we'll, we'll use what we call prophylaxis, but that's going to be, you know, a two-week course of antibiotics because we're pulling a tooth or doing a deep cleaning. So if your ANC is... Normal. Yeah, like low, low normal, one point something and um, your T cells are still very, very low. Yep, there's no reason. No reason. You don't, no reason. Okay, thank yep. you. Good. We have time for one more question. You haven't mentioned anything about receding gums, is that? So, and I'm not really going to. Um, it's something that I think that we're probably going to be publishing some cases within the next year and I'm going to try and collaborate with some colleagues so we can really get a good series together. It's not, it's not something that's really been reported or recognized very well, um, and I don't want to get into the specifics too much, but it definitely can be a problem and appears to primarily be related to sort of a little bit of loss of elasticity and tightening of the tissue, especially down in sort of this, what we call the vestibule or gutter area um, especially in the lower jaw. And beyond that, um, there's not, I don't really have much more to say, but if you have really, really, really extensive recession and you're having symptoms associated with it, um, the only thing that really can be done <coughs> is a procedure where, done by a periodontist, a specialist, called a free gingival graft. And so if that's something where your dentist has talked to you about it, and has really stressed that this is something that is going to need to be done, and you're really having problems, it's not just that they're telling you they don't like the way it looks, but you're really having issues, um, there's no reason not to go for that consultation and consider that procedure. 
and I just I'm, I have someone I'm about to be doing that for also. I'll have a colleague do it. I don't do that procedure myself. All right. I think we're out of time. So all right. Thank you. Thank you all very much.